Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship this morning on the festival of the transfiguration of our Lord. This is sort of a hinge day between the Epiphany season and the season of Lent, which starts this coming Wednesday, Ash Wednesday. So it's the day that we celebrate that uh, mountaintop experience where Jesus and the disciples, where they saw Jesus radiate with um, beauty like the sun. We've all had experiences like that. We've also had a lot of valley experiences these past two years. Uh, And to help us work through those readings, we welcome Pastor Sarah Anderson with us today. Some of you may know Pastor Sarah. She is the associate to the Bishop of the New England Synod for this region. And she is here today to preach and also to lead a forum after worship about what's going on in the church these days um, and ways to help keep congregations vital and uh, mission-oriented during this strange time. Uh, I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we begin our worship this morning with our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who creates us, redeems us, and calls us by name. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves, accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us that we may bathe in the glory of your Son born among us and reflect your love for all creation. Amen. People of God, rejoice in this good news. In Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are descendants of the Most High, adopted into the household of Christ and inheritors of eternal life. Live as the freed and forgiven children of God. Amen. Joyful song we raise, the voice. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly Holy God, mighty and immortal, you are beyond our knowing, yet we see your glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Transform us into the likeness of your Son, who renewed our humanity so that we may share in his divinity, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. First reading is from the book of Exodus. Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and as he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went to speak with him. The word of the Lord.
The second reading is from 2 Corinthians. Since then we have such a hope, we act with great boldness, not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil is still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day when Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to Luke. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone and they kept silent and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. Please be seated. What a gift and a joy it is to be with you to preach um, and to spend time in this community. Some eight years ago now, I think it was, your congregation participated in an experiment happening here in the New England Synod called Forward Leadership Community that has become something else entirely in that time. But you were one of the first early congregations who joined us and it was the beginning of my call to serve on the bishop's staff. So I have had a, a place in my heart for this congregation for quite some time. It was good to see Jack again today from those eight years, Jack. That's a long time. But here we are on Transfiguration Sunday with a familiar text for us and one in which I most always consider how Jesus didn't stay on that mountaintop moment, but instead, after that transforming encounter with God, carries the glory of the moment into everyday moments, even through suffering and the mundane into the valleys of our lives. This time, though, as I was reflecting on the scripture, I kept being struck by two points. 
the first, that this text begins in prayer, with the Holy Spirit coming as prayer is offered, that the glory of God is encountered in a moment set aside, and second, that the purpose, I've been wondering about the purpose and the reason for that desire to create those dwelling places. Where usually I often dismiss the attempt, I was curious in a new way about what that meant for those faithful disciples with Jesus. So let's start with this prayer. I don't know about all of you, but this past week, I feel like I've been praying an awful lot, maybe more than is typical. Between COVID and Ukraine, the future of the church, you know, small little things. And wondering about what prayer does, how powerful it is, how meaningful it is, how it changes us or it doesn't. We don't know what Jesus was praying for, only that the space was sought to pray. And then the Holy Spirit appeared, came among them. I'm, I'm struck by what it means to be in that posture of prayer, one where we're open to receiving the Holy Spirit, not dictate the Holy Spirit, not as we anticipate or expect a particular answer, but to be led into bold newness and transforming encounters with the Holy you know, the hard reality is that the Holy Spirit doesn't always arrive in neatly packaged answers to all our desires. Can you see how I feel about that? Though admittedly, it is often how I pray. Save this thing. Make this possible. It's probably not far from the disciples who were praying and desiring a savior to save them and prevent death, illness, heal the sick, end war. It's an ongoing prayer. And how often, if you are like me, maybe more than you want to admit, do we tend to measure the depth or success of our faith? By the, by the number of spectacular epiphanies we can claim. Those moving God moments, those answers to our prayers, the times when we've overcome suffering, incredibly moving worship where everything works, including the technology, just the way we want. A full church, a sermon that moved us to tears, how often do we claim our blessings based on specific, concrete answers to our deepest wishes? The Holy Spirit came, and with the Holy Spirit, Moses and Elijah, the promises that they embody, not salvation, not a promise of no harm or suffering, in fact, the opposite of it. God's glory was shown in a bigger promise, beyond our limited boundaries, beyond our limited abilities to imagine, certainly beyond what the disciples imagined on the other side of the resurrection. Did you know, currently, in the New England Synod, there are 166 congregations? And 53, 53 of them are in transitional discernment without clergy. That's fun. Or it's something. 53 congregations exploring partnership opportunities, merger possibilities. Some will close having discerned their mission in this time and place is fulfilled, only about 10 of those 53 will call a full-time pastor. 
And while 53 of our congregations are without clergy as they enter that transitional discernment, I think all 166 of our congregations are probably in some kind of transitional discernment in the midst of COVID realities and changing cultures. Sometimes it feels like it would be really easy to despair over those numbers, to use the language of decline, to, be, to pray to be saved from such a trial as this, to fear for the future of the church. But I have hope and a deep belief that this is the time to stop and pray, to be open to the Holy Spirit so that in our encounter with the Holy, we are transformed. To pray in such a way that we see the glory of God shining bright upon a church becoming. Certainly, it's easy to look back to the church that was. Booming memberships, Sunday schools, buildings, popping up everywhere even pre-COVID, is different than where we find ourselves today. And we want to return, to dwell again in that space. And yet in our scripture, when the suggestion is made to create dwelling places in that space with Moses and Elijah, where the Holy Spirit transformed, I'm struck by the fact that, well, I will often say, and have preached in the past, we can't make dwelling places to be stuck in one place. I noticed this time, Jesus, who so often rebukes his disciples, remained silent. Instead, silently regarding that suggestion, Jesus moves on, pointing to what is to come. And it has me considering, perhaps there is something to dwell in, not a place to lock in or freeze Moses and Elijah and this mountaintop experience, but perhaps instead to dwell in the promises that Moses and Elijah embody, a promise of freedom from slavery and all that keeps us captive, a promise of community and a command to attend that community in care. That these blessings, the glory of God, they are transformational, worthy of acknowledgement. But also, they are not a single moment to be remembered from the past. They are not a static reality, a history to be memorialized, but rather a legacy that accompanies us all into the present moment and the next one mountaintop moments and mundane, celebrations and suffering, in death and in life, these promises that transform us go with us. 166 congregation, 53 in transition, 43 will merge or close. It could sound desperate and dire. It could sound like a walk to the cross. But we are people who stand on the other side of the cross, transformed by the promise of the resurrection. I believe with the power of prayer, with the glory of God shining on us through us, it is in fact freedom to walk with, to dwell with the Holy Spirit into something new. One of the hardest truths about being followers of Jesus is that grief and suffering and challenge often walk side by side with glory, new life, hope, and triumph too. I see a church becoming, and I'm praying for that transformation. Sometimes church buildings will close, but other times it will be transformed. Our definitions of community and connection might shift, become more expansive. I think about COVID and remote worship and virtual um, worship. 
There has been hardships and challenge. But also, think about the invitation and expansion of how we see community anew. I was just telling Pastor John this morning that I was asked by someone that I was the trainer for. They were one of my CITs. I still call him a kid. He's 34 years old. He's not really a kid anymore. But he's one of my kids. And he's been worshiping with you. He's been worshiping with you online for many months. He just asked me to officiate his wedding, knew I would be here, and thought about whether he would be able to join you in person. The day was not today. So I can't call him out right in front of you all right now. But the day is coming. How has our worship expanded our connection to those who are homebound, to those who are seeking, to those who are not here in this space, but are here with us, who are seeking and praying and wondering what it means to be a part of the glory of God in community with one another. Pastor John also shared with me previously when I got to meet with your church council that you had renters who left your building. Ooh, we could pray, couldn't we? Oh no, our finances and the trouble of what that means. But in prayer, in prayer, that community, a new community, and this community was open to what could come, to a new relationship. Not just renters but co-collaborators. I think that as we move forward and are transformed by these promises that free us from all that holds us captive, we'll move from competition with other congregations to collaboration. It's a transformation on the horizon. Grief and joy, death and triumph, they walk side by side. But steadfast is the promise of the resurrection. Our story, our freedom and gift as resurrection people is one of triumph over death, of seeing life and hope and of journeying together. That is our witness as church, one that requires no building, yet calls us into gathered community and care for each other. It makes sacred each moment from the spectacular epiphanies to the fearfully mundane. And it both sets us free and compels us to be transformed as we pray and the Holy Spirit meets us on the way. Amen.
church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is poured out upon us in abundance. So we are bold to pray for the church the world, and all that God has made. <clears throat> Transform us by your greatness, O oh God. Send us down the mountain to share joy with all people. Make us agents of change, confident that your hope will vanquish despair and your goodness will conquer evil. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. The mountains and valleys sing your praises. Dazzle us with your presence in every landscape. Bluffs built by ancient glaciers, canyons carved by flowing rivers, flat horizons with uninterrupted views, and sands shaped by ocean tides. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. You love justice and establish equity. Strengthen leaders of local governments, community nonprofits, and grassroots campaigns. Bless them with gifts of integrity, creativity, and sound conscience. Build up safe and joyful communities where all people may thrive. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heal those who are in distress. Give patience to those waiting for answers. Grant hope to those who have reached the limits of treatment. Give compassion, hearts, to those who accompany loved ones through illness and uncertainty. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Hear our cry for mercy for the people of Ukraine. Reveal your presence in the midst of their suffering and fear Give them courage in your promise of hope and life so that desperation and grief will not overtake them. Come quickly to their aid that they may know peace and joy again and bring an end to war in all the world. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Blessed are they who listen to Christ's voice in this life and now rest with him. Transform us from glory into glory and give us your peace that we do not lose heart. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
Since we have such great hope in your promises, O God, we lift these and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us share a sign of peace with each other. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. And you may be seated.
the universe. You offer us new beginnings and guide us on our journey. Lead us to your table, nourish us with this heavenly food, and prepare us to carry your love to a hungry world. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It's right to give our thanks and It is indeed right, our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who, sharing our life, lived among us to reveal your glory and love, that our darkness should give way to your own brilliant light. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, and that earth are full of your glory, Hosanna. Indeed, holy, O God, the fountain of all holiness, you bring light from darkness, life from death, speech from silence. We worship you for our lives and for the world you give us. We thank you for the new world to come and for the love that will rule all in all. We praise you for the grace shown to Israel, your chosen, the people of your promise, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land, the memory of the ancestors, the homecoming from exile, and the prophet's words that will not be in vain. In all this, we bless you for your only begotten Son, who fulfilled and will fulfill all your promises. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Therefore, O oh God, with this bread and cup, we remember the incarnation of your Son, his human birth, and the covenant he made with us. We remember the sacrifice of his life, his eating with outcasts and sinners, and his acceptance of death. But chiefly, we remember his rising from the tomb, his ascension to the seat of power, and his sending of the holy and life-giving spirit. We cry out for the resurrection of our lives when Christ will come again in beauty and power to share with us the great and promised feast. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that these, your own gifts of bread and wine, may become for us the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. 
Grant that we and all who share in this bread and cup may be united in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may enter the fullness of the kingdom of heaven, and may receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place, and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great High Priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Happy are we who are called to his supper. The ushers will guide you forward for Holy Communion. Please gather all the way around the altar to receive the bread and the cup. This is God's table, and all are welcome.
Please rise. Let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, for we have feasted on the abundance of your house. Send us to bring good news and to proclaim your favor to all. Strengthen with the richness of your grace in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We are an Easter people, and Alleluia is our song. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. As we prepare to begin our Lenten journey and turn our eyes toward the cross, we say farewell to the Alleluia, our song of highest praise. We shall sing it again with joy when the day of resurrection comes. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Welcome once again to worship on this festival day. Thank you to Pastor Sarah for being with us today and for bringing the word to us. 
I encourage you, after you get a cup of coffee and a donut, to come back into this space where we'll have a time of conversation and learning with Pastor Sarah. Um, especially for those of you that don't know what a synod is or what a bishop is or what it means to be part of this larger Lutheran church, um, she will help um, shed some light on that and also talk about the forward leadership community and some other things. So please uh, come back in a few minutes so we can spend that time together. A couple of announcements. It's not too late to sign up for the Calumet Retreat, March 11 through 13. Although it is filling up, we have about 41 people signed up, which is great. But if you would like to go, just grab one of the sign-up sheets uh, in the narthex and throw it on my desk, and we will be happy to see you at, for this. Um, be good to be together uh, after all this time apart. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of worship, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, uh, the beginning of our 40-day journey of Lent. And so we mark that time by gathering um, at 7 o'clock for a service of um, communion with the imposition of the ashes, which are a sign of our mortality and, and penitence, but also in the shape of a cross, that even in death we are held by our loving God. So 7 o'clock this week. And then you'll also see for forthcoming Wednesdays in Lent, we're having a book conversation group on the Holy Spirit, creative power in our lives. I have copies of that available if you'd like one, followed by dinner and evening prayer at 7.30. You are welcome to come for some or all of that. Are there any announcements from the community this morning? Seeing none. Go in peace. Shine with the light of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen.